Bach, who is the architect of the S2S uh, prediction at ECMWF. Um, and I put some names here. Um, uh, there are also many more people that um, I need to thank, and they are, some of them are mentioned directly in the slides. So I uh, hope I didn't forget anybody. Um, the outline of the talk, I'll give you a general background on um, aerosol and their role um, in the in prediction in general. Um, then I will uh, talk about how atmospheric constituents impact NWP. Here I'm focusing on the weather aspects. Uh, um, of course, aerosols are very important uh, for uh, climate as uh, uh, most of you uh, imagine know already. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the ECMWF experience about the sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction um, and aerosols. Uh, and then I will mention some coordinated studies that are uh, going on now under the WMO umbrella. And I think they are quite important because they show the interest uh, at operational centers worldwide um, in the topic. And then there is a summary and some open questions. First of all, um, I need to say that this is a complex system. So this is not only aerosol, it's uh, uh, also what we know as uh, greenhouse gases and reactive gases, but um, atmospheric composition is a very complex topic. You have emissions from um, anthropogenic sources like cities and industries, uh, you have, uh, and transport, of course. You have uh, natural emissions uh, of uh, gases and aerosols from biomass burning, uh, from uh, desert dust and the oceans as well, agricultural emissions, and all that into the atmosphere and interacts with the, uh, the radiation and with the um, with clouds and with the um, atmosphere in general and uh, that all affects uh, climate and weather um, and as I said you know there, the um, processes at play are very many and very complex so I focus today on a subset of them um, so here is uh, um, aerosols and weather um, so you have, as I mentioned, several um, production sources, uh, emission sources of aerosols, natural and anthropogenic. And this also, um, you have also different aerosols that are released into the atmosphere, uh, like sea salt, dust, like carbon organic matter, um, sulfate aerosols and ashes from from volcanic eruptions, for example, and um, others from you know, anthropogenic emissions. You have the interaction with the radiation, um, which is uh, mostly the, the aerosols have two effects. They can reflect solar radiation in the uh, infrared, in the, sorry, in the solar spectrum, and that's their main, uh, their main um, action. Uh, but also they can serve as uh, CCN, which means cloud condensation nuclei, so they can modify um, they can serve as agents to form clouds and then modify the um, way clouds interact with the radiations uh, by, for example, uh, modifying the number of particles contained in a cloud at the same liquid water content. And that changes the way that cloud um, interacts with radiation. Um, sorry. Um, that's what you know there are also other aspects that are not covered in this talk um, but um, as I said I will focus on this and um, there is a little bit uh, of a dilemma what I call a dilemma when you come to aerosols because uh, um, the impact of the aerosols depends strongly on the type of aerosols that are being emitted most of them um, our aerosols in most cases are scatterers of solar radiation, which means that the more aerosols you have, the more um, radiation is returned back to the sun, and then you have a cooling effect. So that's exactly the opposite of greenhouse's effect, which is of warming the surface, and that's more an infrared type of exact, uh, effect. But uh, uh, there are some species, for example, black carbon, which are absorbing species, and they have the opposite response. Um, and they tend to warm the atmosphere. Um, and so they go in the same direction as greenhouse gases. And so they contribute to the global warming rather than you know, cooling, as I mentioned, it is the case for the other aerosol species. So um, 
you have this, uh, you know, almost contradiction that if you have a removal of aerosols in a stronger quality policy scenario with reduced emissions, which is good for the health and for the, you know, um, for air quality, as I said, but they can actually have a large impact on climate as, uh, as I mentioned, the aerosols can mitigate the um, greenhouse gases effect. Uh, so obviously it's not that we would advocate to pollute more, um, but uh, it's something that um, needs to be kept in mind and studied. Um, also, atmospheric constituents, uh, and here I, I include also ozone uh, and reactive uh, greenhouse gases, they have a different type of um, they affect uh, numerical weather prediction, weather in several ways and across various scales. So you see the scales go from uh, analysis time, which is, you know, um, the um, now. Uh, the medium range is the prediction at, ten, say, 10, 15 days. The subseasonal uh, range is usually considered between one and three months. And then you have the seasonal range, which goes up to six months or a year. And the, the different, the impact uh, happens at different scales and through different mechanisms. And it could be, um, dynamics or term thermodynamics type of mechanism. Uh, the main one being the interaction with the radiation, either the uh, um, radiation emitted by the sun and the solar spectrum or in the infrared uh, or, in the, or in the UV. Um, and uh, um, you have also indirect mechanisms um, that are happening, as I mentioned earlier, through clouds. So the way aerosols interact with cloud and precipitation, and then they can modify the behavior of, of the clouds, radiatively speaking. Uh, they can impact through uh, what is called the 4D bar tracer mechanism. This is a bit specific uh, to the uh, assimilation, but the fact that uh, the atmospheric constituents are transported by winds um, can have uh, um, indirectly an impact on the wind themselves through the assimilation. So that is actually has been studied, but it's still something uh, quite open, this type of interaction um, within the NWP system. Um, and then I mentioned already uh, the radiative transfer, um, for example, in the assimilation of radiances for temperature and water vapor assimilation. They can impact the water vapor directly to oxidation, that's the methane in the stratosphere and uh, also have uh, a very important role in uh, land sea atmosphere interface exchanges particularly the co2 so as you can see there is a variety of mechanisms so it's quite important to um, look at these uh, uh, aspects i will start with the ecmwf experience and then i'll talk more in general but here's what uh, ecmwf has had over the year first of all uh, the development of the atmospheric composition in the model used by ECMWF, which is the integrated forecast system. This started uh, actually in the late um, 1990s um, with the inclusion of stratospheric ozone and then progressively through a series of uh, projects that are um, listed uh, there, uh, GEMS, MAC, and now CAMS, you can see the acronyms below, um, progressively the system became more and more complicated and couple chemistry and aerosol and greenhouse gases and then now integrated chemistry are now included in the IFS. So it has become a very complex, uh, initially ozone was uh, included as a as a simple in a with a simplified model but now it's fully in the cam system it's a, a full integrated chemical system and there's been a, a quite a bit of uh, um, upgrades to climatologies that are then used in the mwp configuration both for uh, reactive gases and greenhouse gases and also aerosols and at the moment uh, in the NWP configurations, um, a climatology of aerosols and ozone is used, but in the CAMS configuration, which is um, which runs at the lower resolution and includes all the species that I mentioned, uh, they run with interactive prognostic aerosols and ozone. Um, this is uh, run by um, the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, and um, all products um, given, that, given out are free, and you can uh, have a look at the website and go to the database, because this is funded by the European Commission and uh, its uh, operational services. So uh, CAMS deals mainly with pollution on a global scale. Um, 
they use uh, the IFS model and integrate uh, mo mostly satellite observations and um, to produce the forecasts of aerosols, reactive gases and greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, they use uh, a lot of um, ground-based observations to uh, verify the model prediction. And then they use uh, um, anthropogenic and uh, emissions and fire emissions for the uh, to prescribe you know the the fields and uh, it is uh, quite a complex model it has a full um, integration in uh, with the meteorology so it's part of the same nwp model that ecmwf uses for the um, you know for weather forecasts it uses the 4d var system as well and it has integrated chemistry and aerosol representation and an integrated natural biosphere model so that's um, the cam system um, the quality of this uh, atmospheric composition forecasts um, um, it has uh, improved over the years and you can see uh, for example the top uh, um, panel um, you can see that um, from when this started in um, it was 2008 when uh, it was it went pre-operational <clears throat> the skill score has measured against independent observations uh, from um, um, Ironet has increased and um, you see the black line in, like with a positive upward trend as far as uh, the increase of score of uh, skill score and for the ozone as well you see quite a, a nice improvement from when the first um, forecasts went operational and uh, you see in comparison with the reanalysis now the quality of the real-time forecast is just as good as the reanalysis which is quite a success and you have for example here an independent verification using uh, um, carbon monoxide um, Sentinel 5P observations and uh, you have to trust me on this one that when I say that the top is observations and the CAMS model is at the bottom but it is definitely quite a, a good um, agreement you know with the with this field between these fields so the quality of the forecast in um, of atmospheric composition has improved over the years and uh, is uh, quite good. This is an example from the more recent past. Uh, there, there has been a huge event um, in 2020. And actually, this year is quite promising because there have been already a couple of big events. Um, but this one was uh, last year showing the forecast of this huge dust plume that affected air quality in Puerto Rico. You see from the tweets there, uh, you have a picture before and after the uh, arrival of the dust plume um, at uh, two sites in Puerto Rico and you see the forecast already um, you had like you know very good signal um, already at day five um, of the you know the arrival of the plume in the right location so that was quite a good uh, forecast and this is some verification showing Ironet time series so you have a time so that's June and you see the peak when there is that increase the blue dots are the independent observation vision and the solid line is the model prediction and you see a very good timing of the of the arrival of the plume also quite a good agreement in the um, uh, amount of um, aerosol optical that um, that is uh, was you know predicted by the model and then observed as well um, and you also get quite a decent agreement in the vertical location. So those are the lower two panels are to Calypso orbit. So that's a LIDAR uh, from space looking at aerosols. Um, and you see like the location of the aerosols in the model, the bottom panels is quite, you know, in good agreement with the one uh, shown by the uh, observations from the satellite. Um, also, aerosol information is used to build better climatologies for applications in uh, NWP. I mentioned that briefly, and for example, this is work uh, done by Alessio Bozzo um, in using the aerosol um, um, from the CAMS interim reanalysis um, and to, uh, be able to um, include them in the NWP and it's used now operationally since 2016 and you can see that the climatology with respect to the old one you see the plot in comparison with Aronet observations you have the old climatology in green was quite uh, showing quite different uh, um, amount and variability with respect to the current climatology which is in red 
and then you see in black the prognostic arrow. So, so you see that overall the average, the acclimatology captures the average behavior very well, including some temporal variability because it's not a fixed climatology, gets interpolated. And then, um, but it misses the big events, but which is, uh, you know, normal. You don't expect, obviously, climatology to do um, the same job as the prognostic fields, you know, in every every day, every single circumstance. Um, and uh, actually, this uh, um, new climatology uh, reduced um, performed quite well in the NWP and reduced bias in the five eight zonal so wind forecast and 125 hectopascal, which was always uh, something that um, be problematic. And I'll show you also what happened in the monthly. Um, uh, in, a, in a minute. And there is uh, um, consistency, uh, higher consistency between the climatology and the prognostic aerosols in, in the, with this new climatology. Um, so yes, uh, going to the um, experience uh, regarding the S2S scales. So we have a look at the study that I performed together with uh, um, Frédéric Vittar. Uh, the results are published and they're summarized in a paper in the uh, monthly weather review. Uh, so um, at the time we were running um, a model version, which is currently uh, quite old actually. Uh, we, in uh, ECMWF it's measured by cycles and this was uh, cycle 43 R1 and currently we are in cycle 47 R1. So, you know, that several years have passed and in between several uh, changes have happened to the model. Um, but um, at the time we had that system and we looked at what happened when we include the, fu the fully prognostic aerosol in the radiation scheme. So uh, fully prognostic interacting with the radiation, only uh, direct effects were included, no uh, effects on uh, clouds, so no indirect effect. And uh, um, we used uh, uh, free running aerosols with observed emissions, however, for biomass burning. And I'll come back to that. That was quite important. And we uh, chose uh, um, an ensemble of 11 members um, with five different uh, start dates. So for a total of 55 cases for uh, more robustness. And then we ran a reforecast period from 2003 to 2015 and six months of simulation. So we had uh, um, two control runs and two prognostic runs. So the control runs were one with the old climatology. You remember the green curve that I showed you. So th that was by Teg from Tegen um, in 1997. And uh, um, the new, the control two is the new climatology that uh, Alessio Bozzo developed based on the CAMS interim reanalysis. And then two prognostic, one initialized from the CAMS interim reanalysis and one initialized from uh, um, a free running aerosol simulation. So more initialized from a climatology. And um, uh, so apologies, the control here in this slide is the control one, so the one with the um, Tegan climatology, the old climatology, which was operational at the time we did, uh, uh, it was being changed at that time, but it was still uh, used. Um, and uh, I show here the aerosol impacts on the monthly forecast. So this is the temperature bias at week four. So four weeks into the forecast in the two cases, you can see just like, you know, having a, having a look at the impact somehow with the color, you know, uh, you see uh, a reduction in temperature bias in most areas, in particular Mediterranean basin, the Asian dust belt, and also um, the um, North Atlantic dust best belt. You have to maybe, you know, focus specifically in these areas um, and the impact can be between 0 0.5 and 2 degrees, which is actually not uh, negligible. Um, so we were quite happy to see that. Uh, we also look at precipitation bias. So this is again week four, again control one and the two prognostic runs. Um, and you can see that, and these are, um, Yes, precipitation anomalies. So this has been the bias using the reforecasts. And uh, um, you can see again, well, maybe you have to squirt your a little bit more on this plot, you know, uh, but uh, the precipitation bias are slightly reduced in certain um, areas, particularly um, over East Asia and um, in an amount to, you know, not large amounts, but uh, 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter a day. And again, you have to remember that uh, all interactive um, direct 
interaction with radiation is allowed in this run. So there is no uh, indirect impact on cloud or precipitation. So it's only by modifying the, um, basically the heating profile uh, that these effects are you know, achieved. And looking at uh, uh, rank probability skills course, this is, sorry, it's a very busy, like, you know, um, it's a scorecard. So it's not very easy to, to understand if you're not familiar with them, but gist of it, you have a series of, you know, um, meteorological variables in that column, for example, two meter temperature, uh, surface, uh, sea surface temperature, mean sea level pressure, temperature at various level, 50 hectopascal, 200 hectopascal, etc. So you can just, uh, you know, just have a look at that, you know, and uh, you don't need to take it all in, you can find more information in the in the paper. But uh, this is just to uh, show visually, you know, in one card, you know, what happens when you change something in the model. So it's quite useful. And you can see one is for the prognostic uh, run one, which was initialized with the, um, with the um, climatology. And the other is uh, prognostic run two, uh, um, sorry, prognostic uh, one was initialized with the CAMS interim reanalysis, whereas prognostic run two used the climatology for the initialization. And that's uh, compared to the control with the tag and climatology. And you see a lot of blue, a lot of blue, dark blue is positive. And the interesting thing is you see an impact also at week four, particularly at upper levels. So it's, uh, and sometimes in variables, you know, like winds and the temperature at 500, um, in one case, or winds at upper levels, 200 at Pascal. Uh, so it is definitely quite an interesting result, which we didn't quite expect. So what uh, could be the reason for that? Why, does, why do the interactive prognostic arrows have this type of effect? Well, first of all, um, we went and looked whether uh, there was some um, explanation for this impact at the subseasonal scale. And we found out that actually um, the subseasonal areas of variability um, explains a quarter of the total AUD variance, the intraseasonal variance of AUD. And uh, you can see that there is quite a bit of uh, um, First of all, seasonality in the aerosols, which is, we, we knew that, but you know that can lock in with certain phases of, um, for example, the MJO. And so that's uh, where we think that the predictability comes into play. And we had a look at, from our runs exactly at that, of uh, how the aerosols were modulated by the MJO. And uh, um, in particular, we looked at the dust um, optical depth anomalies, and um, we looked also at the biomass burning. So let me start with the dust. So these are dust optical depth anomalies. And on, in one column, uh, you have the, the um, fields from the um, prognostic run um, with the, um, in the different phases of the MJO, phase two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one. Uh, sorry, I'm not gonna uh, be able to go into like, you know, details of what these phases are, uh, but you know, they are just different uh, phases of the MJO with convection and happening in different areas of the world, um, across the world. And so you have that panel from the prognostic run and a panel from the cancer interim re analysis, which we use as a verification. It's not a perfect verification, but uh, show it, it shows the same pattern, meaning that, you know, in the um, prognostic run, in the forecast, we had the very similar patterns as sort of quote, quote, observed, because there comes interim reanalysis constrained by aerosol optical depth observations from the MODIS. So you could see that it, there was, you know, an element of uh, observations in there. And the patterns are quite similar, actually, although for the CAMS analysis, you can see bigger, you know, bigger features, maybe bigger anomalies, but they're still like, you know, very much present in the prognostic um, run. And in particular, opposite phases of the MJO have opposite impacts on the aerosol variability, uh, which uh, suggests that the aerosol modulation, modulation by the MJO is a real signal. And you can see that as well in the um, carbonaceous aerosol. Uh, so these are um, aerosol produced by um, biomass burning or by um, industrial emissions. And you can see that the patterns, again, are not identical to the ones uh, 
shown by the, the analysis, but they are quite similar. And um, somehow there is quite a good uh, correspondence and as well as uh, in um, an opposite phase. I think in the case of the, um, of the dust, um, it's a bit more, it's more visible because the dust is mainly, um, the, the main um, source of dust is the Sahara Desert and that's in the tropics. So you actually could see more there, but you still had quite, you, you can still see quite a bit of uh, in, in, impact as well in the uh, biomass burning, in the, the carbonaceous areas of anomalies. Uh, and of course, you know, the other thing that you have um, as a byproduct of uh, this is also the prediction of dust aerosols, for example, a month ahead, which is not something that um, has ever been done before. And uh, it's sort of a byproduct of this investigation, but it could be quite interesting for many applications, people interested in dust forecasts. There are several countries that are very, very much affected by dust. And so we actually here compare the skill of our runs with respect to persistence, that is just considering the previous week and just leave it, you know, um, just continuing with the same type of uh, forecast. Um, and uh, um, we uh, noticed that uh, in particular week one, uh, but also even a week four, uh, the, the skill of the uh, monthly forecast of dust was a lot higher than persistence, particularly when initialized with the comes in the analysis, which is the, you know, orange, orange, um, bars. So definitely an interesting thing to explore further. Um, then, you know, the other thing that is quite relevant is looking at what happens in the case of uh, extreme events. For example, this is the um, Indonesian fires of uh, 2015. Uh, that was a record breaking year for Indonesia. Um, the, um, this was uh, um, a humanitarian crisis because uh, an excess of 400,000 people died as a consequence of this uh, um, of these uh, uh, intense fires, and the whole region burned from August to um, no, to October, and. Um, it was uh, possibly connected with uh, um, a very dry season connected to an El Nino. And uh, um, there was a huge amount of uh, also greenhouse gases emitted, uh, this uh, described as the equivalent roughly of the entire annual output of Germany, as you can imagine. Here I put some like some um, plots uh, provided by Mark Barrington for that. And also we had a look at the biomass burning anomalies um, and that's reported in, uh, in a short um, article in State of Climate in Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And you could see that the anomaly were just off the chart in that region. Um, so what happened in the uh, runs that uh, we uh, we had? Well, um, actually, very because we used observed emission, as I mentioned, that's very important. So we had, um, so it wasn't really like a forecast. It was more more like a reforecast exercise. So we knew what emissions we had. So those were prescribed. And you have a panel on the left showing the fire radiative power uh, average over August and October 2015. And that is from where the emissions are derived and they are fed into the, to the model. And then what happens three months, you know, actually because we had those emissions three months ahead, we could uh, predict the cooling due to the smoke aerosols. So that is quite, uh, you know, unheard of, but and you can see that the pa the pattern of cooling is actually mirrors um, the areas. You know, you have like a performance between the uh, the cooling and the areas where the highest um, fire rate power, um, highest like you know uh, fires were observed, and you could also see that you know six months ahead. So this is started, uh, the forecast started on 1st of May, and then uh, you had the temperature anomalies for October. So six, six months ahead, the signal was there. And that's just because we used observed emissions, of course, that wouldn't be the case if you didn't have observed emissions. Uh, but um, that actually 
and shows how important this could, can be, uh, this type of uh, very extreme uh, events. And also, it, you know, incidentally, it also shows that there is a need for a predictive fire dynamical model for this type of cases in which you can possibly have like some kind of a predictability provide, um, for example, for particularly for events that are connecting to El Nino, um, like this was. Um, this is an example from uh, um, Tim Stockdale showing the importance of um, stratospheric sulfate uh, for, in this case, seasonal prediction. Um, and you can see that um, if you have, like, you take ERA interim as sort of like the baseline and you look at the run of the uh, seasonal uh, system, ECMWF seasonal system at the time was season uh, four, now it's five, but with an incorrect uh, vertical distribution of stratospheric volcanic sulfates, you have a completely wrong temperature response in the seasonal forecast. So you really, um, particularly in case of major volcanic eruptions. So uh, you can definitely see how important to have like the correct aerosols um, is for certain applications. And, and recognizing that TCNWF uh, is uh, um, has led a consortium um, for a, a European uh, Union funded project called CONFESS with the objectives to understand, in fact, the importance of aerosols in, um, in, uh, on the seasonal prediction. And uh, um, there's a component um, in, in uh, this project that looks specifically at uh, volcanic aerosol and biomass burning as well. So uh, very much, you know, inspired by um, the research that I showed you. So uh, we are currently in the first year. It kicked off in November, Project Confess, and it will run until 2023. So we hope to make some more, you know, uh, step forwards in the treatment of aerosols and also uh, vegetation and land cover um, in, in um, the C3S seasonal systems to be able to improve the seasonal prediction. And in general, CNWF is very much interested in um, exploiting uh, the atmospheric composition uh, developments um, um, for, for NWP. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, being summarized, the requirements and recommendations have been summarized in a tech memo um, by Rossana Dragani. And the aim is to understand um, through a thorough and coordinated testing what level of complexity or, and co or coupling it is needed in order to get the most of NWP, you know, for the NWP aspects. And the, the focus uh, is on uh, ozone, aerosol, and um, CO2. Uh, also at uh, uh, the level of WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, uh, there's been an initiative on understanding the impact of uh, aerosols on numerical medium range and subseasonal prediction. And this is a project sponsored by the uh, Working Group on Numerical Experimentation, the S2S project and the Global Atmosphere Watch uh, project. So those are all WMO initiatives. And here I put uh, the names of the colleagues that are involved. And and um, we created, uh, well, the goals of the project are to understand how important the aerosols are um, in the, um, at the short range, medium range, and S2S time scales. And also what it is, uh, how, um, it, whether, you know, there is skills to, for the prediction of aerosols at, at all these scales. Well, we know that in the short range, the systems are rather skillful. Um, as I showed you earlier, but at the, S2S, at the S2S scales, that's less clear, but there is definitely some good signal there. And uh, also, um, um, so it's both like an investigation of the impacts of the aerosols on the NWP, so on the meteorological variables, but also to understand um, how good the, the predictions of the aerosols in C is for various applications. And uh, uh, we look at, um, we set up a protocol for these experiments. Uh, the forecast, re forecast will have to cover 2003 to 2018. 
focus will be on monthly runs so it's not uh, it's not going to be a seasonal you know impact on the seasonal but it's definitely the sub seasonal scale and uh, we focus on two start dates um, may uh, june july or august september october the first set of dates is to look more at the impact of saharan dust because those are the months in which you have the biggest activity in in dust saharan dust and then you have um September, August, September, October is the biomass burning season. Um, so that's where we you focus more on the impact of the biomass burning aerosols. And uh, there are several uh, variables to be analyzed, analyzed um, to be um, like two meter temperature, surface winds, precipitation, aerosolotical depth in say, etc. And this is all run uh, by um, CP Tech, Ariane Frassoni is the um, architect behind it. And they will also run verification. And for now, um, the protocol has been distributed and we have a timeline for the completion of the experiment, which is two years from the start of the exercise, which started last year. So, um, sorry, two years ago now, uh, time flies. So now the deadline for the, um, for the runs is uh, uh, September 2021. And uh, we have uh, uh, quite a bit of interest at several centers. And in some cases, we already have the simulations. I'll show you, I'll show you a couple of examples right now from various centers, CMA um, from China, KMA, Korea, NASA and NOAA from the US, JMA, Japan and ECMWF. So those are our centers that have S2S systems with aerosol capabilities. So that's the, the requirement. So this is like a, a repeat of the uh, runs that we did with Frederick with a more recent cycle. As I mentioned, this, uh, this is a model version, right? Um, and now the current one, it, it's uh, cycle 47R1. So many changes have happened, including now the aerosol climatology, which is officially the one uh, defined by Bozzo and based on the CAMS interim reanalysis. And when we look at the, this is just the measure of the skill. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but just look at where the biggest impact is, is in areas with aerosols, so particularly the Sahara Desert and the Central Africa biomass burning area. And uh, unfortunately, the red means degradation. So in this case, the run with the prognostic aerosols, um, contrary to what we found out before, is less skillful than the run with the climatology. But so it's not going in the hope the right, the, the right the, um, direction we were hoping for. But the important thing is that it it shows a very high sensitivity to the aerosols. So, so um, and that's very important, I think, because it does show again regardless of the model and the direction of the impact, let's say, it, it shows that it's very important to get the aerosol correctly, you know, in, in the model. And that's actually a work that Adrian started when he was still at ECMWF together with another colleague, uh, Mark Rodwell, showing exactly that, how important the correct definition of the, um, of the uh, aerosols is. And, uh, um, but yes, I, wanted to have a look at what happened um, to the Indonesian fires of 2015 in this new model version. And it, once again, you see the same strong regional signal, signal connected to wildfires and as in previous experiments. So that was uh, good you know, to see, meaning that maybe globally, we didn't get the uh, hoped for impact, positive impact of the prognostic aerosols. But when, it, when you are looking at extreme events, obviously you still need prognostic aerosols and not the climatology. And uh, um, this is work from the uh, Chinese colleagues, um, Yung Chen Zhao Yao, Yun Chen, sorry, I'm not pronouncing it, uh, pronouncing it right, but Zhang Chen Yao and Tong Wu from the uh, China Meteorological Administration. And they uh, also ran the same setup with their model. And this is just to show uh, a, a comparison of the dust fields that they, they um, obtained. And you have, um, sorry, the, the fonts got a little bit, uh, you know, messed up, but you know, when it says dust in parentheses comes, that's a verification using an independent data set that comes the analysis. And then you have dust direct only, which is the prediction. So uh, the, the labels got a bit mixed up. And uh, you see that the prediction is actually quite remarkably similar to the, uh, to the, um, Reanalysis, independent data set. So very nice skill in the monthly prediction 
of dust from this model. And you have uh, like um, the, the panel at the bottom on the right that shows, you know, um, uh, like uh, higher amounts of dust, um, uh, particularly in the northern hemisphere. This one is from a fixed run, so like having like a fixed climatology, um, so no prognostic arrow. So, and you can see that actually uh, it is the one with the prognostic interactive aerosols that has the best resemblance within independent data set, the independent reanalysis data set. So it's very interesting that they get similar, you know, good skills from the one month prediction of aerosols like we, we got, you know, in our, in our runs. Um, and we need to uh, also look at that in the current runs for this WMO exercise. So, okay, I'm down to just two slides. So I'm about to conclude. First, um, a summary. Um, well, I don't think I need to convince you that aerosols are an important uh, part of the Earth system. Um, and in general, atmospheric composition plays a huge role in climate and weather. Um, um, if you have an accurate numerical weather prediction model with physical and chemical processes, this is in general a good start uh, for um, to model aerosol and atmospheric composition. So, like I think the CAMS forecasts are, you know, quite good because they start from a quite quite good um, numerical weather prediction model. In return, some elements of the composition can help improve the weather forecasts, um, or at least we hope for that, at various temporal scales, including the uh, S2S scales. And um, uh, of course, it's a trade-off maybe between the degree of complexity and um, the benefits that this uh, uh, offers, uh, particularly when you're talking about uh, um, specific applications for NWP. And also there is, uh, I think, uh, the added benefit that the uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction of the aerosol fields themselves could be of use, particularly, as I mentioned, for uh, some uh, aerosols like uh, biomass burning and dust. There are some open questions. I mentioned the complexity versus benefits. And it's very difficult to find one size that fits all in atmospheric composition modeling because you would need very high resolution for certain applications and you or you would need maybe like ensemble modeling for others. So it's very difficult because also it's computationally very demanding. Um, but um, definitely we need more scientific investigation. There is limited experimentation that's been performed so far. That's why the WGNE go S2S -S experiments, uh, WMO experiments are very important you know for that because it offers a chance to uh, have more models look into this uh, problem and you know come up with solutions and uh, um, we know that climatologists are extremely useful in in fact you know uh, right now at the moment uh, they in the ECMWF runs uh, we're not able to beat the current aerosol climatology with the prognostic aerosols but they are not you know so good for extreme cases. And uh, that's something that I think we need to also look into because extreme cases may be rare, but they are very, they, their impact is very important. So that's something that um, a, um, seasonal or S2S system needs to address. Then there is, of course, as I mentioned, the cost of additional model complexity. And uh, um, there are some. Out there, for example, single precision which still hasn't been explored. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of maybe optimizing, rewriting, code rewriting that could be, you know, um, like uh, introduced. But these two points are mainly for to convince my upper management to look into this problem rather than, you know, so they're just open questions for me and uh, for us, um, not necessarily scientific, but they could definitely have, a, a, could be quite important for the future. Uh, operational configuration of, uh, for example, the ECMWF model, or as we have seen, the CMA model for that matter. Um, so um, I guess that's all I have and I uh, leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, okay, um, so- Adrian, um, shall I stop sharing? Uh, no, no, you can keep it there in case okay. you have a question about a specific okay. uh, slide that comes out. Okay. okay.
So we have actually had a few questions come through, uh, which you weren't able to see, Angela, because they just come through yeah. to me, I realised. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm not able to see the chat. Yeah, I thought they would actually come through to uh, all of uh, our co-hosts, but anyway, so um, the first question was from Kirsten Tempest, so uh, mm -hmm. hopefully Kirsten is now unmuted. Kirsten? Hi, Hi. yes, uh, thanks Angela for the nice talk. Um, I was just wondering about the the actual model that you're using um and it was related to a talk i heard yesterday by eugenia uh, calne uh, talking about the importance of a two-way feedback between um like human produced aerosols mm -hmm. so it could be like um from fires and the earth system models so like the normal mm -hmm. nwp and so i was just wondering if this aerosol um, implementation, is that ingrained in the actual uh, NWP or is it like an external implementation? And so is there like a two-way feedback um, between mm -hmm. the model and the aerosol implementation? Um, or is it just data of the aerosol and the atmosphere is fed into the model. I hope that was clear in my question. Yes, you can yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kirsten. Yes, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. It's very important. It's uh, um, There are a lot of feedback mechanisms at play. In this case, uh, uh, the aerosols are completely integrated in the NWP model. Um, they are, um, you know, run with a slightly different configuration at lower resolution uh, because of the cost, but uh, um, they are, you know, completely integrated, which means that if you modify temperature or winds, that also in turn modifies aerosols, for example, the transport, but also the emissions, because uh, if, um, aerosols like uh, sarandas, dust, they are, um, the emissions are parameterized as a function of surface winds and other parameters, but mostly surface winds. So if you modify the winds because of uh, the presence of aerosols that will in turn modify the emissions of certain aerosol species. So yes, absolutely, you are you are right. It's a complex system. In this case, it's fully integrated. So yeah, um, and uh, I think uh, it's quite important to to have it so to be able to understand you know the various feedbacks. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Can I just uh, ask Angela, you say it's fully integrated, but I presume that doesn't include yet uh, um, microphysical processes in clouds, or is it actually accounted for also in the, uh, should we say, the warm rain and uh, ice microphysical physical processes now? No, you're right. The microphysics uh, comes into play in the um, only as a removal mechanism uh, for the yeah. aerosol. Okay. So yeah. you Wet. have parameterization for wet sedimentation and removal of aerosols, but then you don't have a mechanism, say, to generate more clouds because you have more aerosols acting as CCN or ice nuclei. For example, dust is a known, you know, uh, good ice nuclei, but no, we don't have that two way feedback. Yes. Okay. Yet. Okay. Yeah. So the next question is from Sebastian Muller. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I have a question out of uh, curiosity. With the present event of Saharan dust over mid-Europe, um, do you have an educated guess or an estimate or a rule of thumb how much temperature reduction this brings, um, like for daily maximum temperature? Yeah. Um, yes, thank you, Sebastian. I mean, um, they are looking, my colleagues in CAMS are looking exactly at the case that you mentioned because it was quite uh, extraordinary. And I think you might have seen on the internet a lot of plots of um, photos of uh, pink snow over the Pyrenees, for example. Um, so to be honest, given that it's winter um, and um, you you have quite a fast removal because you know it, it got snowed down quite quickly um 
I don't think you would see a big impact on the temperatures. I may be wrong, but it's more like a gut feeling and it's actually being studied as we speak. I wish I had some uh, plots to show you about that, but it, it's still ongoing, you know, that analysis. Um, however, you know, it's unfortunate that the model doesn't have indirect effects because I believe that the fact that it's been, you know, um, cleared out so quickly, it must have had a huge impact and having a lot of available uh, moisture you know, to be precipitated in the form of snow. I think that might have been the biggest impact than the direct on temperature. But as I said, it's more like a gut feeling that I have than uh, concrete. But if you think that, you know, if the same type of action had happened, say in the summer, you know, and uh, over, say over ocean, you would have had probably a bit of a uh, more of an impact on temperatures. Usually you have one degree per one AOD measure. So this depends can have very large AOD. Uh, by the time it gets to Europe, not that large, you know, but still, um, so you would have, you would definitely see the, the impact. We see the very well the impact of, for example, forest, forest fires in um, California from last year, from September, uh, even several degrees impact on surface temperatures. So specifically this episode, I don't think so much, but uh, in general, yes, roughly one degree per one unit of AOD. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, sorry, <laughs> thank you, Sebastian. Uh, the third question was from Karam Mansour and he asked me to read it out. So, so he was saying, when we look at aerosols, we often focus on the anthropogenic or high impact extreme cases. But he was wondering, what about basically marine environments and marine aerosols, such as sea salt? He was saying, how much effort has there been to validate the accuracy of those in these, uh, should we say, reanalysis and forecast products? Do we have an idea of how accurate uh, the marine environment assessment of the aerosols is? Right. Um, that's a very good question because uh, marine aerosols are the most elusive, I would say, although they're probably the most abundant. Because when you think about the ocean surface, you know, particularly if you consider background aerosol, as you as uh, you mentioned. Um, so, um, yes, I mean, the satellite data are usually actually probably more accurate over ocean than land. So you'd have a kind of a good, you know, like handle um, on the, say, on the AOD. Uh, but it is also difficult because it's low values. So you can lose sensitivity and accuracy. Uh, and you don't have many stations um, from the ground, you know, so the aeronaut stations that I mentioned in my talk, they're mostly on land. So it's true. I guess they are the most elusive aerosols and difficult to know. I the model that looked at, and um, there was a case that when they were uh, overestimated, um, and uh, that has been, you know, uh, modelers, the modelers in CAMS have addressed that, trying to like change the parameterization. But even that is very difficult because there are a few observations directly of marine aerosols, you know, and you may have some ship observations, but, you know, to develop global parameterizations that are valid all over the world, you know, for every condition, wind condition, et cetera, et cetera, it's difficult. So yes, it's probably, I would say they're probably the weak point, the weak link of the- So do you have a good, I mean, with aerosols, one of the tricky things is you can have sources of errors, uh, first of all, with the assimilation, in terms of the atmospheric composition, but then also with the sources, and then you have errors associated with the dynamics, which of course will grow over time with lead time, uh, and then the way you represent sinks, because you mentioned wet deposition. So uh, is there a kind of a feeling, for example, of, uh, for example, at day five or at S2S timescales, which of those dominates? Is it, for example, the meteorological errors in winds that dominates at like week three? And is it like, are sources, for example, important uh, for like dust aerosols, for example? Uh, it's a very good question, Adrian. And to be honest, not one that we have addressed fully. Uh, okay. I can tell you my gut feeling. For certain aerosol, it's the transport, uh, okay. but for others, for others, it's definitely the emissions. Um, right. Particularly, I would say biomass burning, you know, because if you just don't have the emissions, there's nothing to transport. So 
I definitely, but for dust, because mm, dust is parameterized using winds, then it's more like, it, it could be a combination as well, not having the right amounts and the right size, because it's not only, you know, the total uh, amount of aerosol, but also it's like how big they are and how fast they get deposited or how fast they uh, can, tr uh, how far they can travel because they are maybe finer particles. So yes, it's a very multifaceted, you know, it's a multifaceted problem. Uh, but I'd say, you know, it really depends on what aerosol. So probably transport more like, you know, wind emitted aerosols, so natural aerosols and uh, um, biomass burning, they are natural aerosols as well, but you know, I mean, like ones that are more connected to episodic emissions. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that leads on to a question actually that's related on observations from Bruce. Hello. Hi, Angela. Um, oh, hi, Bruce. <laughs> what are the most important observations of aerosol and composition now and possibly in the future? Well, thank you for asking, Bruce. So we, um, I didn't mention that, I didn't stress that, but um, to be honest, you know, uh, the aerosol problem is highly underdetermined. So we have like too few observations because uh, right now we rely almost entirely on aerosol optical depth, which is an integrated quantity. And it, it sums up the contribution from all species. But for example, at the beginning, if you remember, I mentioned that um, uh, depending on what species it is, it could have like a different impact on weather and climate, say warming or cooling. So, so I'd say that if, if I could have my wish list, speciated information would be you know, on the top. We have now LIDARs. Um, so we have at least a vertical distribution. Uh, they are not used um, like in the analysis at the moment, but we are working towards that. Uh, so, you know, I'd say that um, uh, there is still room for a lot of uh, improvement. And there is like a very nice uh, ground-based uh, system for uh, that of stations that provide very detailed information on light scattering, on number concentrations. Um, I am like more thinking for the assimilation aspects, um, you know, like we're still are somehow under constraint, particularly satellite of global observations you know because even the networks obviously do not cover areas for example you have nothing in the in the Sahara Desert which is the biggest uh, you know source of aerosols so yeah. you know you have like several layers of problems you know uh, somehow it, it, we there are very good observations but we are still needing more you know particularly for assimilation applications okay thank you very much uh, Bruce for the question we have two more questions. I think we have time to squeeze two more in, Angela, if you're okay. Yeah, for me, yes. Yeah, Mark now. So the next one is from uh, Christopher Sano. And... Uh... Hi, uh, thank you, Angela, for the great talk. I, I just have some question about uh, how much time does it take for uh, one week or one month prediction during an extreme case? Like, for example, during the volcanic eruptions or during the Indonesia fires? Like, um, that's a good question, Christopher. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, please continue. Uh, um, yes, I. to be honest, do, do you mean like um, computing time or, because there are, you know, I guess, there are this different level of, you know, how long it takes. The problem right now is that for extreme events, we don't have a mechanism to activate the emissions, you know, so there we would need a mechanism to be able to say, you know, prescribe the emissions um, or at least, you know, tell the system that it is, you know, there is a volcano which is erupting and modify that, you know, at the moment it's it's not quite uh, there. And as far as how long it takes, you know, if you're talking about computational cost, to be honest, at, at a lower resolution, the aerosols do not add, well, I say that, they add approximately 40% to the computational time. So it takes 40% longer um, to do that, to do it. A forecast, but um, it seems it's a lot, of course, particularly if you, you're in a time critical type of path. So you have to issue the forecast, you know, within a few hours. Uh, at the same time, as I said, we haven't tried any optimization, any specific 
you know, like things to make it faster. So it is difficult to, to, to answer your question, basically, you know, um, I, I, I don't know. But I don't know if you wanted to ask something else as well, because I came in. So if you, if you have more or if this didn't answer, please let me know. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so the last question is on the uh, Madden Julian oscillation. So I'm going to pass the floor to Sergio. Uh, hello, Angela. Great talk. Many thanks. And I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about the relationships between the uh, MJO and the aerosols, please. Yes, so to, I need to first uh, do a premise and thank you for uh, your very interesting question. Uh, this has not been really studied very much. So we look very much forward to looking at the other S2S runs, you know, to see if they see similar patterns that, that we do. So what we see, you know, it's not only specific of the ECMWF model, but it's a robust, you know, physical signal. However, we do think that there must be a connection between MJO and uh, aerosols because MJO is the main mechanism of um, like that drives predictability at the monthly scale. And you have uh, patterns of convection and convection and um, dryness. And when you have convection, you have aerosol removal. When you have dry, you know, like pattern of uh, long dry periods, uh, you may have more emissions, for example, of desert dust, or this is a bit, you know, maybe stretching it, but um, say if you are in a very dry spell and it's um, fire season, because most of the fires, particularly in Indonesia, they are also induced by, because of agricultural practices. So they're not only naturally occurring, but say if you like have had a particularly dry spell, uh, you know, there, there might be even more, you know, more um, fires than, than usual, than you would have usually. So definitely have this pattern of precipitation in dry, you know, dry spells. So um, as I said, I cannot prove it uh, 100%. We can, at this point, it's more speculation, but I, I, I don't see why not. You know, how is that possible that the MJO, which has such an impact on precipitation patterns in the tropics, as how come, you know, how is it possible that it would have no impact at all on aerosols? You know, <laughs> it's it's sort of like I answered with a with a question, uh, but I don't know if I convinced you, but I think, uh, you know, there is there is some like, you know, logical connection there and we just need to explore it more and maybe try to look uh, at observations you know see what like uh, observations tell us brilliant okay well thank you very much angela i think that uh, concludes all the questions it was really a nice way to kick off our series of lectures um so i just want to thank everybody for tuning in we had uh, almost 100 participants uh, listening to you today, which is a, a fantastic uh, uh, number to uh, have here. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Just to remind everybody, if you uh, think that somebody might be interested in these talks, please pass on the details of the registration page and the description. Uh, next week, uh, the series passes over to Trento to do the hosting and their first invited speaker, which is the second speaker of the, the series is Massimo Bolasina from the University of Edinburgh. And that's actually going to be continuing on the aerosol theme. So I'm not sure if that was by chance or by design that we have the two aerosol topics right at the beginning of the series, but I think it's quite nice because it gives a, uh, some continuity to the theme. He's going to be talking about regional impacts of aerosols uh, uh, on climate. So. I hope uh, to see you all uh, next week at uh, three o'clock here in the, uh, the second talk. And in the meantime, again, once again, thank you very much and uh, have a very good uh, week. Uh, thank you again, Angela, and uh, see you all soon. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Angela. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.